The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Looks like we've got about uh, 53 people here, so we'll kind of take our time going through the intros real quick, but uh, again, glad you could join us. My name is Carl Dean. I work with Rockstar Capital. I have an asset management background. Uh, I work for a couple different firms in, in Dallas. Now I'm down here in Houston working with Rockstar Capital. Happy to be here. Uh, and uh, I'll kind of let you guys go through it. Robert, start with you, and then we'll go through Nick and Brandon. Hey, everybody. I'm Robert Martinez, uh, founder and CEO of Rockstar Capital Management. Uh, we started in 2011. Today we have 19 assets, uh, 3,762 units, uh, asset value of just under 400 million, a uh, little personal accomplishments. Uh, our company has won uh, 17 city, state, and national apartment association awards. I'm a two-time Houston owner of the year and the country's only two-time national owner of the year. So uh, congrats to Team Rockstar. We wouldn't be here without them. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Flewellen. I'm a senior managing director at Marcus and Millichap. I'm headquartered in the Dallas office, but uh, we do deals all over this region, all throughout Texas. And um, myself, my partner, Bart Hoover, uh, and then we have a, a a very large team of, uh, of folks that are uh, helping us get uh, get deals done. So, uh, you know, in my career, I've done probably two and a half billion dollars worth of multifamily sales, and uh, you know, we're we're uh, we're still growing. So we're uh, we're excited to be here and uh, navigating these uh, challenging times we're in right now. But uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna be ready to to come out the other end uh, with a bang. Right. Brandon Brown, uh, managing partner here at LMI Capital, uh, just boutique advisory firm here, doing lots of uh, BNC multifamily apartments primarily. Uh, we do our share of A's. I've uh, been working with Robert for quite a while as well. Uh, just, you know, doing what we do. Uh, been in the market for 20 years. Uh, like I said, primarily multifamily guys. Uh, all over the state of Texas, outside of the state as well. So. Uh, looking forward to getting on the call here, talking a little real estate. Yeah, and so, you know, for those of you joining us, you know, the purpose of the webinar, obviously, you know, the title kind of says it all, how COVID is affecting your multifamily investments. Uh, we wanted to really grab some of the key players that are on the front lines, right? You can hear everyone's opinion on what's going on in the market from their own perspective, right? Whether it be buyers, investors, whatever the case may be at different meetups and things. But I thought to myself, you know, who are some of the top guys I know in, in the space of lending, in the space of selling deals, obviously in the brokerage, and then obviously management with Robert and Rockstar and, and, and investing as well. So um, we wanted to put something together for you guys to really understand from the front lines of, of what's going on here. The guys that are in the trenches every day doing deals, making things happen. Right, what's a pulse on the market? So we're just gonna go through some basic questions, kind of get a get an idea from everybody as to you know how COVID has affected them, uh, what they're seeing moving forward, maybe the silver lining and all of that. So uh, you know, diving into just kind of the first question, and this applies to everyone, just you know, I, I guess what are the major ways or the the um, yeah, the major ways that COVID has really affected your business? And obviously, you know, we know volume is down, but what are some of the other ways that uh, that it's affected your business? And we'll start with you, Brennan. I mean, obviously, primarily just uh, not being in the office as much, you know, uh, <laughs> not out shaking hands, all the events kind of miss a little bit of, of that part of the business for sure. As far as just day-to-day -day functions, uh, everything's kind of the same in, in that regard, but yeah, just really more on the production side. Not as much acquisition activity, obviously, um, and you know, in general, just you know, things are, have just been a little bit off. Otherwise, it's kind of operating procedure as normal. It has given us some time to uh, kind of go through some of our models, you know, beef up some of the procedures, and kind of be ready for when the market swings back. So I'm kind of excited about what we were able to do on some of the housekeeping stuff that tough to get to, you know. Yeah. Nice. How about you, Nick? Yeah. I mean, I think. You know, it, it's funny when you think about the brokerage business and, and obviously the folks that are tuned into this call have likely looked at deals before. It's there is a lot of face-to-face uh, -face contact. It's a, it's a hard business to do without, uh, without that face-to-face -face contact. And so, you know, uh, like Brandon said, you know, just beefing up uh, some of our processes, being a lot more active on the phones uh, in the time period that, that we couldn't be as active in person. Um, and, uh, you know, just trying to figure out ways to, uh, to, to gain an edge, uh, right now when, uh, 
Um, you know, people are a little bit uncertain. And I, and I think, you know, our, our, for the last three, four months, you know, our role really shifted from obviously selling deals when there weren't a lot of deals to be had to, to really just uh, being an information source. And so we, we really tried hard to, uh, to just educate people, keep them up to date. I mean, things change daily right now. It's moving fast. And, and so uh, just, just trying to be uh, some, someone that our, our clients can call on and get the latest information and, uh, you know, be, be a valuable resource at this point in time. Yeah. Robert, how about you? How's, how's it mostly affecting the business? Man, I'll tell you what, COVID-19 was the best thing that ever happened to us. It's 100% true. We got a chance to separate ourselves from the noise. I, I like to use the expression wartime general versus peacetime general. I was there in the recession back with Brandon Brown. I remember he and I were friends. You know, I, I was there when we were buying those early deals, and he was telling me, you can buy this deal at 15 door, you should do it. And, I mean, I, I, you know, it, it was a wonderful time. But what I learned was I learned how to kill what we're going to eat tonight. You learn how to get better. And what's happened in the recent years, a lot of operators, a lot of sick here, have gotten really fat and happy. You know, those guys that are paying for it right now, if they didn't innovate, if they didn't get better, they didn't, they didn't try to improve operations. Uh, virtual reality has been, or virtual tours has been a big topic of discussion. We put that in three years ago. We put that in because we knew there was a time and place that the leasing offices might not be open, that people don't want to come to. I didn't think it was going to be a pandemic. I, I really didn't, didn't go fortunate to tell that but i knew there was a time when people were going to go online and so when people were not getting leases right now we were getting leases we were able to continue to generate and convert uh, uh new applications into leases we've actually um uh, have leased more year to date this year than we did last year and you're like well how in the hell that happened because everybody went online how did netflix find 16 17 million people that you know that, that weren't there the month before because they were there and, and now they become the biggest player. You know, we wanted to make sure that we were in a position that we were going to succeed, we were going to win. As a company, we stopped buying. We started focusing in on, internally on what we do as a business. And we had holes in our business. And we realized this is not the team that's going to get us where we want to go. So during COVID-19 was a great time for me to sit down, look at my operations and understand my strengths, my weaknesses, and make, make those hires. We made some key, well, I couldn't buy any opportunities I bought some key acquisitions in in house. I got about 80, 90 years of experience that I brought into the company that was not here the day before COVID, and that's really uh, exciting for us. We're ready for for the rest of the year. Yeah, and uh, so it seems like a kind of a general theme across the board is it's given everybody more time to kind of look inside their business and work on kind of sharpening the pencil and fine tuning some of the interior detail of uh, how the business kind of operates. So. Uh, speaking to volume, you know, what's, what's been the volume, what's the volume been like the last three months versus like, say, looking at like last year as, I mean, significant decrease, obviously. Um, what about you, Nick? What are you seeing as far as like your, your close volume over the last three months versus last year? Oh, I think you're muted. There we go. Uh, so it's been a, a, a big, you know, big shift. And, and, you know, what's interesting is, so we were looking back at, at, at some of our stats and kind of looking at, at things year over year. In the first quarter last year, we had a huge finish to 2018 and a very slow first quarter in 2019. So this year was the total opposite. We had the biggest first quarter we've ever had. We closed 17 deals, about 265 million in, uh, in volume in Q1. And then obviously come March, and that was actually not even just Q1, that was really, that was January and February. March rolls around, we had a couple of deals scheduled to close, you know, the brakes got, you know, hit and people pulled back and either dropped deals or, or pushed pause and wanted to see how things shook out. We've closed since the start of COVID four deals. So not, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it, those were scratching and clawing to the finish line. I mean, those were not easy deals to get done. We have seven in escrow though right now. And so some of the deals that, uh, that didn't make or that, that, the buyer bailed. We put some of those back together. We've had a couple that um, uh, we've we've been able to kind of uh, get new buyers in, and uh, and so now the pipeline is is really filling up again. Uh, obviously, we're uh, we're just now launching deals. Um, you know, we can we can talk more about that in a moment. But we're we're just now starting to relaunch deals, and uh, the activity is, is is tremendous. So we we can talk more about that in a moment. I don't want to get sidetracked, but but the bottom line is. Through the end of July in 19, we closed about $200 million worth of, of assets, which which was 18 deals year to date so far. This year, we've closed 21. We're going to close probably three uh, three more before the end of July. So 
we'll be actually up year over year uh, through July. Um, but you know, we'll see if the 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 back half of the year pipeline uh, can can catch up to to where we ended up finishing last year. Yeah, our investors are hungry. Send us some deals. Rockstar investors, they need to put their money to work. The, you know, and, and, and I think that is absolutely the case. There's a, a lot of folks that are dying to buy deals. And so, um, you know, it's just a matter of can you get the pricing to work and can you get the debt to work, right? So, yeah. What about you, Just in case, it's Robert at rockstar-capital.com. <laughs> Do not forget. Send us something. We want to get the dollars. There you go. Brandon, what about you with the volume? You know, comparing to last year, just looking at it year over year, what's that look like? Yeah, obviously volumes uh, off this year as a whole, just given COVID, uh, you know, the requirements that the agencies came out with the uh, PI reserves along with the tax insurance, CapEx for the full year in addition to the ongoing reserves really hurt some deals this year. Um, to echo a little bit what Nick was saying, like last year, uh, you know, Fannie and Freddie both tapped the brakes pretty hard around September, October until they had those new allocations come out. Uh, that gave them the ability uh, over five quarters uh, to go do the 100 billion, but they had to you know, stick to their mission of the 33%, et cetera, on the affordability side. So, uh, you know, that really affected us a little bit towards the end of Q3, uh, early Q4 last year, uh, which then equated to similar to what Nick said, kind of a, some deals closing early in the year. Uh, but then, you know, things kind of falling off during this time. Um, during this time, we have been able to close some deals. Um, it looks like we've closed in the month of June, we closed a few. Uh, in May, we closed a couple. And this month, we've closed one and we're scheduled to close a couple more. So we're still able to get some deals done. Uh, we are starting to see, you know, a lot of other, a lot of lenders come back into the market today, which, you know, I know we'll hit on. But overall, you know, things have been a little bit softer over the past, uh, you know, three months as a whole. Yeah, and, and Robert, uh, I know you you tell us a story. You you walked away from a deal due to COVID, obviously. So, what what's what's your volume been like last three months? Kind of touch on that. Yeah, you know, COVID nineteen again was the best thing ever happened to our company. But for my for my fun life, for my personal life, it sucked. And we had a Disney trip planned. Uh, and that, you know, that, the, the day before COVID shut down. When my kids and I we were supposed to go to Disney. That didn't happen. Brandon Brown and I, we were going to go to Napa Valley. That, that didn't happen either. So I'm not too happy with Nap with uh, COVID. Uh, from a business side, though, we had two deals that we were chasing. One of them we had uh, we had already in escrow. We we had the earnest money there. I walked away from it. I couldn't put my team at risk, just like the lenders when 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 things aren't stable, when they're not ready to go, they're not going to move forward. They're going to make it so that it doesn't look advantageous to move forward, right? They're going to kill the deal. And that's what we had to do with one of our deals. We had to walk away from earnest money. I think it probably cost me uh, fifty thousand uh, dollars, which was not happy. I wasn't happy about that. But if, if it recovers, I'll get a chance of first right of refusal. Another deal. I was literally seconds away from wiring the escrow over, uh, uh, and it didn't happen for us. So uh, I was disappointed by that. Brian and I, we had to refinance on one of our deals that got blown up. Now there is a silver lining. The deal was strong. We we're doing better because of COVID nineteen. Our virtual tours went through the roof. Leasing is up. NOI is up, and now we're actually going to wind up with what, Brandon? The better part of nine hundred thousand, a million dollars more in proceeds, which is great for our investors. So, I mean, it, it kind of worked out. It was just more of a delayed closing, a, a ninety-day closing. If we get that done this month, you know, no harm, no foul. We're going to make a few more dollars. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, as far as, and maybe this is an, a more one of the more obvious questions, right? So, for people who are in the space and in doing deals. They kind of understand, you know, what's making them hesitant. And is it safe to say, you know, just the fear of the unknown is kind of what's what's the biggest fear for sellers right now? Is that is that really it? Just that, you know, for sellers and buyers, I should say, just the fear of unknown. Would you would you agree with that? I'd say more buyer than seller, right? I mean, sellers are sellers. Contracts as is. Rarely do you get a financing contingency unless Nick's a great broker and can get that done. I don't know. Um, you know, we had one teed up, ready to go. Uh, we knew the seller. It was one of our, you know, longtime clients. Uh, our client and the seller happened to work with the same agency lender. Everything was teed up, ready to go, but there was the uncertainty of what would happen to collections in July and August and going hard with earnest money. Um, knowing that these loans are tied to the, you know, monthly collections and you're going to be held to that along the way of the process, 
that buyer just isn't quite comfortable, you know, moving forward. So I'd like to hear what Nick has to say on that front. I feel like we've had that scenario come through the office a lot in the last, say, month, and just that uncertainty of how would they be impacted during the process really is is the biggest question I think for buyers. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's uh, it's been a really fascinating thing to watch because you know this hits and, and Robert, I can, I can feel for you with all your travel loss. Cause man, I, I, I was, I was literally at the slopes when it hit and I got to ski one day and then the rest wow. of it got all blown yeah. up. So I, and I've had a couple other trips canceled. So I, I, I feel for you, but, uh, but, but, you know, this all hits and then the world shuts down. Um, and then, you know, buyers are concerned with and sellers for that matter, like, Oh, what's going to happen in April? Well, then April comes and it's not, it's not that bad, right? Not nearly as bad as what everybody thought could be the worst case scenario. And then everybody's like, well, that's good. People had a little money in savings. Now what's going to happen in May? Oh, well, May was fine too, right? And some, and a lot of properties, May was better than in April. Um, mm -hmm. Then, you know, we, we everybody keeps finding something to worry about, right? So then June, what happens to June? Now July's ending. What happens when the uh, enhanced unemployment goes away? Uh, you know, and, and, and then you look ahead and you have, uh, from a seller standpoint, um, you're, you're probably worried about a buyer now uh, getting getting good debt. They you know they know the challenges that are out there on the debt side. How do you raise equity in this environment? I mean, are you getting a great deal? Of course, equity is out there, but but they're not dying to pay pre-COVID aggressive prices right now when they have to escrow a lot more money with the lender. Um, and so you know, I think it's just a combination of, of uncertainty in operations, debt, equity. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, if you really wanted to, to throw something else in, you know, we, we, we have this, uh, little election coming up here in, in a few months and that just adds more uncertainty. So, you know, there's been a lot of talk from, from my clients is, Hey, when's the, when's the time to go? Um, Hey, I want to sell this this year for whatever reason, whether it's, that's what my business plan is, you know, I'm in the promote, I want to, I want to kind of cash in. I'm worried about, you know the political landscape uh, moving forward, whatever reasons, um, my interest only is burning off. Um, or I just, you know, Hey, look, a new buyer can get a sub three interest rate on a loan. So it seems like, uh, there's some, there's some really positives there, but, but at the end of the day, it's like, man, there's still a lot of volatility and there's still a lot of things that, that people are, are nervous about. And you know what? My biggest clients aren't really all that nervous about it. You know, they're, they're out there buying deals, just like Robert said, Hey, I, we're, we want to buy deals. We've, we've geared up, we've made improvements internally. We're ready. We've got money and we're ready. And I think that is starting to be the sentiment out there. But, um, but thus far, you know, those have been the big concerns for people is, is literally every variable in the transaction. The other thing, when this whole thing started, the, the property taxes were coming out. So everybody was wondering, am I going to get some property tax relief? Oh, and by the way, insurance costs have skyrocketed. So I've got property taxes going up. I've got insurance costs going up. I'm having trouble raising equity. Debt, I'm having to escrow all this money. I'm not sure about the operations moving forward. So it's like the perfect storm of, of five, six, seven different things that, that have made deals complicated. And uh, I think those variables are starting to, to get a little bit uh, more in focus uh, moving forward. Or, or, or people are just getting impatient, tired of not buying deals. Yeah. But, uh, I, I may, maybe a combination of both, but but I, I think deals are about to start happening again. Robert, for you, what what's been like the biggest concern from a buying standpoint, selling, refinancing? I mean, what's what's been your troubles and issues? Yeah, you know, Nick, you're a smart guy, man. You've taken all my talking points away. Uh, <laughs> that, 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 that's exactly it from the buyer side, right? Because it's all about the NOI, revenue minus expenses equals NOI. And what that NOI is, is the, 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 based on the cap rate is what I'm going to pay. Well, if collections are down, that means my NOI is going down. That means I'm overpaying for something, right? If, if expenses are going up, like taxes and insurance that weren't going up before, now I have lower NOI. Again, I'm overpaying. The big fear for buyers is that they're going to buy something today that will be worth less next week, mm -hmm. next month, when the next turn, the next turn, turn of a uh, rents due, right? July is the last month of the extent of the enhanced extended benefits for an appointment. What happens next month? Is it, is it, are they going to stop paying or is everybody just going to go back to work? You know, I, I don't really know, right? I know a lot of people were making more money staying home than what they were uh, working before. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, now the caveat to it is though, is that 
the riverboat gambling, everybody is coming out. Capitalism is coming out. I got money. I got money. I got to get it to work. Well, as Nick said, when the rates are coming down, hey, I might be a buyer right now. I can't get rates like that before COVID. Now they're really, really low. The problem is a lot of these guys that are tied up to the bonds on the sales, they're, they're uh, what do you call it, Brandon? They're, they're prepays or they're, they're yield maintenance or whatever that uh, the um, defeasance is going up. You know, the, the, the deal we wanted down in South Texas that I walked away from, he, he doesn't want to lower his price right now than what he was, than what he sold to, what he was going to sell to me back in March, even though his collections are down because his defeasance has gone way up. And he doesn't right. like, well, I'm going to lose money now. I, have to, I can't give you a better discount. I know it's not worth what it was before, but my defeasance has gone up. So there's a lot of factors that affect the buying process that were not there the, the day before COVID. But if rates keep falling, man, I mean, tell you what, necessity is the mother of invention. People will find a way to do deals or you can refinance your own deals. I mean, we, we got to deal with Brandon. We're going to refinance this month and return, you know, the lion's share of all the equity back. Uh, we've got a couple other deals in turning that we might even buy back ourselves, buy, buy our old investors out and put new investors in because those are deals that we know and, and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the interest rates are so low. It makes sense to do it. Yeah. Five so, years IO, you're going to pay three and a quarter, done. So for some of the people who may be watching who are more you know, beginner, intermediate investors or maybe just passive investors, could you kind of uh, or could one of you kind of touch on in more detail what, what you mean with the defeasance fee? So obviously that's a that's a that's a basically a fee you have to pay if you sell the deal too early or whatever the case may be. Could you explain that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, I mean in a nutshell, it's basically making sure the lender when they securitize the loan, it's basically just a guarantee to the people that buy it that they're going to get that interest. That's essentially what it is. So the longer you pay on it, the let the more it goes down. Yeah, they're going to get that interest no matter what. I mean, if your if your note rate, for instance, is four percent. And there's five years left in the loan. They're going to look at what the remaining term of treasury is, which is the five-year treasury, which is probably what I don't know, 40 basis points or something right now, maybe 20 basis points. So you've got a pretty big delta there. Well, that delta is essentially your penalty year over year for five years remaining. Pretty punitive. You can kind of figure the math out if you're looking at you know three and three quarters over five years. So, so that's it's essentially basic way to explain it is that what caused his his defeasance fee or yield maintenance whatever it was is that what caused it to, to increase correct because even in robert's scenario on our refi uh the 10 year you know the treasury's dropping the delta between your current interest rate on your note and the remaining term of treasury that gets wider the wider that gets the penalty goes up gotcha um yeah so it's it's kind of double-edged sword that yeah we were looking at a 425 rate now we're at a 325 rate on our new loan but our prepayment penalty went up so you just well, have to run the math figure out the, the okay. return and when, when you know when you're when you're home free and you know on a refinance like roberts with five years io you get home free pretty quickly okay yeah the bank always gets its money carl yeah, this no, no, I, just, I, I want to make sure everyone understands that, <laughs> you know, basically in a nutshell, it's, it's, it's the delta between your interest rate and where the five-year or 10-year or whatever is, and it's, you know, as that goes down, that increases your margin, so you, you pay more. So I just wanted to make sure that yeah. that was clear. Yeah, yield yeah. maintenance is just making sure they get their yield, yeah. basically. Right? Yeah. Their money, they make sure they get their money. Um, so you both have kind of said, you know, deals have started to bounce back. You know, before I get into that question, I had a question that I was curious about. Are you seeing um, sellers or buyers look at deals and when they're underwriting deals, like I was looking at a deal the other day and there was a significant amount of, um, you know, uh, collections do bad debt, right? Because people stopped paying their rent and they're starting to take advantage of the system and whatever else. And the seller's mindset was, well, that's just because of COVID. That's not normal operations. And so he's, you know, trying to get me to exclude looking at that and so how are, obviously, from a lending standpoint, you have to look at that stuff and underwrite the deal as the numbers show currently. Are you seeing people that are kind of, you know, looking past that as a buyer saying, well, that's, that is because of COVID. And if I ran the numbers based on X, Y, and Z over, you know, maybe not using a T3, maybe I use a T6, you know, T six, trailing six months. Are you seeing people look past that or try to get around that at all? Like the, the oh, that's because of COVID kind of thing, right? My numbers should be should be X, Y, and Z, but because of COVID, I've got you know forty thousand dollars of bad debt that's crushing me over the last two months. Does that make sense? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll let Nick chime in on what he thinks, you know, his conversations are with buyers or even sellers talking about VOVs. But on, you know, on my side, it really depends on the real estate, right? I had a conversation with someone earlier today on a deal, very similar, kind of the economics were off. You know, it's 91% occupied, but it's 78% economic. That's not going to hunt with the agency lenders really on getting you the leverage you need. So do you like the real estate? Do you believe in the deal? And in this instance, it probably wasn't an agency kind of go put yourself and lock yourself in kind of loan. Um, you know, Robert and Sam and I discuss out on a handful of acquisitions over the past 18 months, and he's in some floaters right now with no prepayment penalty at sub 3% interest rates. So we have flexibility. Yeah. So I think that's what I would ask in that scenario to the buyer is like, do you even care? You know, is the real estate worthy? Are the rents there? If your plan's a million and a half, you know, rehab anyways, then who really cares what they're doing right now and their credit loss? We can get in there. COVID's gonna go away. You're gonna be able to evict these guys. And then I just see it as Robert and his crew gets into those 30 units and flips them quicker. And now we've got something to market quicker. Mm -hmm get home free quicker, meaning in 18 months versus 24 months, you're looking at a refi. Um, you know, that's just, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And I, that's how I see it. If it's a good piece of real estate, go take it down. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously you believe in the operator, but what, what about you, Nick? Uh, what, what? Yeah, I mean, I 100% I, I agree with that. I think, um, I think you have, um, you know, I, I think like every deal is going to probably have some sort of economic, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be off a little bit economically. Now, sometimes the rental incomes up, but you still don't have your late fees. You still have other areas. Sometimes uh, the rubs fees are down because, you know, some people that aren't paying the rent are certainly not paying paying that either. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think uh, I think our focus as brokers is, hey, look, I want you to look at this from a five-year perspective. And it's, at the end of the day, is this really changing what you were hoping to accomplish? Um, and, and of course, everybody has a different attitude on, on how soon we're gonna come out of this and, um, and, and what that looks like. But I think if you can get a good, reasonable loan today and, uh, and you still love the real estate and you still love the strategy and you still love the, the play on the deal, I think, um, you know, I, I think those deals are, are, are likely to, uh, to, to trade, um, you know, the economics off on some of these ones that we're looking at, yes, they, they are off. And, um, you know, I, I can't say with 100% certainty what the investor reaction to that is going to be because we're, we're kind of dealing with that right now as we are just now starting to launch some deals. But um, I, I, I feel that the initial reply, just for example, on the Spring Lake deal that we just launched this week, um, you know, we've had 150 CAs. Um, you know, downloaded already or executed already. And, uh, and that's a huge turnout regardless. Uh, and if you look at his numbers, you know, yeah, some of the economics are off, but um, but at the end of the day, I mean, they're not off much and and people that want to buy that piece of real estate are, are, are willing to, I don't want to say give them full credit as if uh, it didn't happen, but they're willing to chalk it up to, hey, look, you know, your leasing has still been strong. I realize you can't get rid of these folks uh during during this time without evictions but you know based on how how it's going out there I, you know i feel confident if i had to evict these people tomorrow i could get these units leaked quickly and, and they'll give them some type of credit for that same thing with uh in our underwriting on late fees you know they have been non-existent for the last few months we basically taken a t12 pre-covid for late fees and kind of put that in as is the late fee number uh because we know the late fees will just pick right back up once once this is passed this. So it's uncharted territory, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna figure it out on the fly here and see how uh, folks are underwriting it. But I, I think that that makes sense in general, uh, as long as you can get it a decent loan. I mean, at the end of the day, if you can't get a, a decent loan, if it kills your LTV and knocks you down to from a 75 to 65% LTV, yeah, it's gonna affect the price. But if you can get a, a, a fairly similar loan um, then, then I think we can still get these these deals done at, at pretty good numbers that that sellers will be happy with. Hey, Carl, like if I can jump in real quick. So I just want to say that for, from a buying side, if you're, you're what you're asking the buyer to do is to accept something less than what he would have had to accept pre-COVID and pay the same price. 
That's what you're asking them to do. And, and you're basically, you're, you're just squeezing, you're putting your, your thumb on him to see how much he's willing to take. And really, that's why you're seeing it slow down because a lot of guys don't want to, don't want that pressure. However, if there are deals out there that are at the right corner of the right corner, you know, if there's lesser competition, it does represent an opportunity to maybe acquire when nobody else wants to acquire, mm -hmm. right? If you think if we're going to go back to the norm by X period of time, then maybe you can pick up a couple of deals with less competition. So I want to, I want to ask Nick, Nick, are you seeing less buyers right now or are you seeing more buyers because of a pent up demand? Well, yeah, so I, 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 that's a great question, and, and, and I've been interested to, to know the answer to that myself. I, I think we're seeing a higher or as high CA count, CA count, because people want to look at deals because they're just, they, they're finally happy to see a deal hit the market. My, my prediction would be that we'll have less offer activity, and the offers certainly will not be quite as high as, as they were pre-COVID. I, I, I think, you know, we could have a, you know, a, a 5% delta. You know, I would say that's been fairly uh, standard. I mean, some deals more, but but on a deal that wasn't hit as hard as as some others, you know, uh, a, a four or five percent delta in pricing pre-COVID to now, um, and and on ones that were hit a little harder, more. But I, I think the offer activity will be less. I think the uh, the CA activity will be similar or or higher. Um, property tour activity has been good so far. Uh, but you know that's also kind of interesting. You wonder if people are going to want to even get out and walk around and be around a bunch of other people or, or what. And so far, that doesn't seem to to be down. Uh, but but you know we're early, so 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 yeah. it's a little hard to say. But I, I would anticipate the offer activity will be less and will be a little lower. Well, that might lead into your next question, Carl. Is like you know because a lot of buyers, you know, as he was saying, even though there's pent up demand, they want a deal. They want a deal on the deal. They want a discount. They don't want to pay. We had a couple. We have a deal that we had. We had uh, uh, for sale, and we had a couple offers come in recently. They were way below what the offers we, we, that we rejected back in February. You know, like, well, who is this guy? You no, know, we can get rid of him. We're not going to even respond to the offer, right? Yeah. So it's one of those things where I don't know. I think every buyer wants a discount, and if the seller's not ready to give it up yet, then that's going to um, that's going to affect your 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 frequency and your velocity of, of deal flow. Mm -hmm. one, one other thing I'll add that, that's happened on this deal is um, with, you know, just the, the some of the crazy things that you've seen some of these states do during this time period. And that's been obviously interesting to follow. I, we, we've seen a couple people come from, you know, the West Coast that have said, I got to get my money out of California into somewhere else. And so they're used to super low cap rates out there. So they come here and, and maybe what, uh, you know, the cap rate that might seem a little low to people like yourself, Robert, who are, who are buying, you know, lots of deals in Texas, you know, they look at it and compared to California, it doesn't look that low. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so I, I, we have, we've seen a few people, I, I literally had a call from our Palo Alto office and had a call from uh, our Atlanta office uh, of, of, you know, folks that have a big client that's like, I really want to try to move some money into Texas right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll see if, if they end up being uh, players for this deal. Early in my career, most of the money came from California. And then that kind of settled uh, and, and, and I won't say it went away, but a lot of the local investors, uh, you know, started winning a lot more of these deals over the last five, six, seven, eight years. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see as uh, as a response to how some of these states have, have uh, maybe not been as business friendly as others. If you see money coming in from the coast, if you see money coming in from New York and, and some of those different places that, uh, that maybe some investors have been unhappy with, with how this has been handled. That makes sense. Great point. Yeah. So, you know, it sounds like the deal flow is starting to pick back up. I know both of you uh, have kind of mentioned that it's, it's, you know, you're starting to see more deals. You're starting to see more people wanting to refi or, you know, obviously in my email, I can tell that there's there's been some pickup in, in deal flow. Uh, is that kind of across the board? Do you agree with that point? You, you're starting to see it kind of pick back up as far as, you know, people willing to sell a deal or trying to get a refi done? I agree. Definitely. I mean, last three weeks, each week, there's a little bit more, you know, more, more momentum, I guess you could say. Um, a lot more people, you know, wanting to kick the tires on looking at properties or, uh, you know, our pipeline here specifically, I know we've got, you know, several refis that have kind of come in over the past week or so as they kind of look at their P&Ls, like 
Nick was mentioning, and April was fine. May was fine. June was fine. We're still leased in July, doing fine. And so they want to go ahead and take a stab at it and see what could happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would say, you know, we we just launched this one deal. We literally have a deal. I just signed a new listing up today. We literally have a deal scheduled uh, to launch in each of the next four weeks. We yes. got a couple that have a student component, so we're waiting until we get a little closer to fall. Um, but but the lease up's already been going really, really well on those deals. Um, so so that the plan on those would be early August, but we have we have a deal that we're launching next week. This one that we signed up today will be launching in two weeks. And then we have another one, you know, the, the following week after that. So we, we've, we'll have four straight weeks with, with launching at least one deal. And then we have a couple other ones in the works that we're, that we're trying to figure out the timing on. So, yeah, I think it'll pick up. Obviously the, the wild card will be if, uh, you know, if Texas decides to shut it down a little bit, uh, for a little while again, you know, that, that could be a hiccup obviously, but, uh, you know, at this point, um, you know, that, that's, um, we're, we're, we're certainly hoping that doesn't happen. Yeah. Hey, Nick, are, are you seeing buyers? Because I haven't made an offer yet. Are you seeing buyers put in the condition where if there's another shutdown or a COVID-19 event that, hey, I want my earnest money back? I fully expect to either A, see that or B, see some sort of uh, performance mechanism. I, I don't think... Um, you know, I, you know, we, we, I don't think people are going to get finance contingency still, um, you know, some will ask, I'm sure, but I doubt the ultimate winner is going to have, have a lot of contingencies, but I do expect that, that that'll be something that people ask for it, which is, Hey, either my due diligence gets extended. If, if there is some sort of mandated, uh, you know, stay at home, uh, you know, shelter in place type order. Uh, it gets extended by whatever, however many days I had left when that happened, or, um, or you know, or I have the, the right to terminate or a right to extend the contract or, or something along those lines. But yeah, I uh, I, I haven't seen it yet, but I I'm not going to be at all surprised to see that. And actually, the last two deals we we closed, which were both bought by the same buyer, um, initially in his LOI, it was accepted that was hey our timeline doesn't start we were during it was during shelter in place so my timeline doesn't start until they say you know the shelter in place has been lifted but before we got it the contract signed uh, it was it was lifted so it didn't end up coming into play but i, I fully expect we'll see more of more of that type of, of language especially right now with with some of our cases on on the rise here yeah Robert, this might be a good question for you. It just came in here in the comments or question box, and it's it's specific to uh, Congress talking about kind of lengthening the period for you know uh, preventing evictions. And I, and I you know I've talked to some investors that that have said, look, these you know people there are people taking advantage of the system. You know, it's it's more or less on these C class deals where they're very uh, you know the the demographic is very much like service industry related type of uh, you know tenants. And, uh, you know, some of them are just can't pay and others are taking advantage and they just they've, they've got kind of, you know, tenants not paying their rent and it's just kind of a growing pain. Uh, do you see this becoming more of an issue? And, and do you think you could really squeeze some people out of, you know, a comfortable position with their with their assets? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a lot to answer there. I think we're very fortunate to be in Texas versus a lot of other blue states, which, you know, they're making it sound like rent rent free forever and no evictions ever. In Texas, I think it's going to be a little bit harder hand. But until you pull out the pacifier from the baby, we're not going to go back to norm. Simple as that. You know, you've got to say, we're not going to take care of you anymore. Nobody took care of nobody during the recession. That's when my career was born during the recession. That's when I was buying deals with Brandon Brown, who was there when I started Rockstar, and buying them at 15000 a door, right? Until they take the pacifier out of everybody's mouth, we're not going to get better. Uh, now, also, I'm not going to live on rumor. One of the things that we did during during uh, the shutdown was that we made sure that we controlled the narrative. We made sure that we soft called, warm called all of our investors. I mean, yeah, well, for our, yeah. warm called, soft called our investors, but also our, our our residents and let them know that help was coming. Here's real information. I didn't want them getting their information from Facebook. I didn't want them getting their information from from uh, Instagram or th or or from their mom who got their information from Aunt Ruthie. You know, I want to make sure that we gave them the right information so we could control the narrative. I think it's very, very important because there's a lot of misinformation going around. I don't want my residents ever thinking that this is going to last forever. I want them understanding that they have an obligation to pay their rent and, and we are collecting on that. Mm -hmm. And if they don't pay, we're going to have to go through what 
the legal contract between us and them says. I'm going to provide quality housing. I'm going to make sure basic services exist, water, a roof over your head, and cold air conditioning. You're going to pay your rent. It's a very simple thing because that's the same agreement I had with Brandon Brown, the lenders they, they, that they all work with. I pay my mortgage. They let me the money. Very simple. The best best business partner in the world is the bank. If you if you if you understand all that they wanted to get paid, well, I'm in the same boat. We have an agreement. So you just need to control the narrative within your residence and not let them run wild and think that they're not going to pay rent. Yeah, and you're, so you're saying, and because I'm I'm obviously aware of what we did behind the scenes, but like sending out emails to all the tenants and having the office manager call them and kind of work through those problems and be a little sympathetic and empathetic towards their situation. And it kind of encourages them to continue paying the rent and do all they can to, to stay in good. The worst thing you can do is put your head in the sand like an ostrich. And many people are doing that and they're just waiting for this to pass. And they're just letting whatever God says is gonna happen, happen. That's not how it works. We have thought, we have free will. Pick up the phone, talk to your residents, pick up to the phone, talk to the, your, your investors and keep the lines of communication occurring. I think one of the great things that COVID-19 has, has uh, started was more communication. I mean, I've been on more webinars in the last 90 days than I can, uh, you know, in, in the last uh, 13 years of, of my career. And this is gonna continue. We're gonna continue to do webinars. You know, whenever you have a big event like this, it breaks old habits and it starts new ones. And I think we're gonna be doing a lot more communication like this, but you gotta communicate. Mm -hmm. Communication is the key to life. Tell me what you need, tell me what you want, and let me see if I can do it for you. If you don't communicate, you're gonna be at zero. Yeah. All right, so so now some of the questions really really for you, Brandon, uh, specifically is, you know, uh, obviously lenders are looking at this environment a little differently. How are they underwriting deals differently than they were before? Yeah, I mean, as far as the actual underwriting of the properties, it's still kind of the, the same. The impact is what we're talking about where, you know, typically we're underwriting rental collections on a T3 and we're looking at other income and rubs on a 12 month basis of which it's really like we're getting nine months worth of credit for what should be 12 months right now, right? But trying to sell that story on uh, properties has kind of been tough. Um, there's a little bit of an impact there. Uh, you know, depending on lenders, depending on the program, whether it's a small balance world or uh, large loans with the agencies, there are some uh, cash out refinance, for instance, in Houston with Freddie SBL, they want to be at a 70% level and a higher DCR than they were post COVID or pre COVID. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it just kind of depends from, from deal to deal. Uh, I would say that in general, you know, leverage is off a little bit just as a whole in the market, whether it be from life company to bank to uh you know agency in a whole i guess you know just from the standpoint of of uh higher coverage ratios being required and it's a case basis though too right the sponsorship plays a role in a lot of these things too um for instance we have a a, a deal we've shopped to some banks and the bank's comments are i'm at 65 or 70 percent now it's an existing customer we're going to be at our typical 75 percent loan to cost like we normally would because we have a history there and they're you know they're an existing customer so that's that's really kind of all the impact I, that i see from an underwriting standpoint obviously there's a big focus on the collections and what's happening you know with covid but i mean i know robert property pretty well obviously and we we know we've seen a lot of other uh, of our legacy clients assets during this time and checking in with them and, and looking at their properties and and everybody's doing pretty darn well. If you're a decent operator with a capitalized property, um, in a lot of instances, collections aren't off, but they're actually up. It's, it's impressive. Hmm. So what about uh, like uh, acquisition financing for a stabilized deal versus like a value add? What are you seeing as far as the difference? Yeah, I mean, on the acquisition side, obviously for something stable, if we're looking at the agency, you have that 12 month P&I to consider. Um, and the way I look at that is if Robert said, hey, I, you know, I have to raise this extra million dollars for the P&I. Well, I also know Robert's business plan pretty well and the improvements that they like to go do on an asset. And we all know that doesn't happen in the first six to nine months anyways, that a lot of those projects happen in month 10 or 12 or even 14 for that matter, uh, especially when it comes to maybe interior stuff. So the way I look at it is, yeah, we're going to bring that money to the table today but with the release provision changing to basically six months out looking at months seven eight nine 
we're confident we can get it in month nine. Well, there's some rehab dollars we have available. Give the rest back to the group, put the rest in the operating account, whatever we need to do. But look at it, I got to raise extra equity. Look at it as actually that's part of my rehab fund potentially that I'll get back in, you know, in nine months. That's on the stabilized side. On the on the bridge side, it's it's kind of like my scenario earlier where yeah, the economics are off, but who cares? I'm looking at what it's going to be. And Nick made a good comment about we're looking five years down the road, right? Not cash on cash for 2020. Who cares? We're looking at that five-year IRR and what we're really going to give to the investors. Yeah. So on that front, the impact has really been the non-recourse bridge debt. Um, the CLO market has all but gone away. Uh, there are groups that are still doing some non-recourse debt. Um, some is cheaper than others. Some is a little bit more expensive. And basically, they're just pricing it higher. They're going to put it on their balance sheet, and then they'll go sell that paper at some other time when that market's back. So that's what, 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 I'm sorry, Brandon. Acquisition financing. Yeah, Carl, what I was going to say, so for everybody listening, you know, the bank is the largest investor in the property, right? They own 65% of the deal. They own 75% of the deal. They own 80% of the deal, depending on what the leverage was. All they're doing is trying to safeguard the property. All they're trying to do, it may be a little less return, but they're just trying to make sure the deal survives. That's all they're doing. And I think if you, if the syndicators or the investors can can understand that message, yeah, maybe the ROI is a little bit less, but you've improved the financial health of that deal so much more right now. And, and I can tell you, the guys who are getting hit the hardest right now, are, and, and Brandon knows this and Nick knows this, are the guys that bought their deals in the last 12 months that are going through that rehab phase, that, are, that, that were assuming X collections that took out the 80% LTV, right? Or the 75% LTV. Those are the guys getting hit, hit the hardest right now because you know, the NOI went south and now taxes are going up and the insurance is going up and it just, everything's going against them. So all the bank's doing is just safeguarding the investment. Mm -hmm. It's not always fun to watch, but if you understand it, you get it. So, but obviously you're going through like a refi right now. So that's, that's something that's obviously a possibility, correct, Brandon? Like doing a refi right now in this market? Oh, absolutely. No, we have quotes right now. The, 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 the only, the only negative is just the asterisk of having to put up the P&I that you get back at a later time. Mm -hmm. That's the only asterisk. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're, you're low three, low, low three on this one. We're five years of interest only on a cash out refi. I mean, it's the market's there for the right, for the right deals and the right sponsors. Um, the, the, the capital's great. I mean, the, the great money available um, for qualified deals. And to hit on what Robert was saying, I think the properties that are going to be struggling are the guys that stretched and overpaid two years ago and did some sort of agency or CMBS debt with a couple of years of IO and the IO has gone right now. And P &I and they didn't capitalize it like Robert would. They didn't change out HVAC. They didn't do those things mechanically. And now the boiler's going out and things aren't working right and they don't have the capital to, to sustain. Those are the opportunities. And I'm sure those are the guys that Nick's watching on the TREP report to see if they're late on their payment for July or not. Hey, hey guys, break, break, breaking news, Brand. This is a new subject for you. One of the investors who's watching just said, FYI, HISC just announced virtual learning starting September 8th for six weeks. October 19th, parent can opt in to continue online or start face to face. face, -to -face. So now you have everybody's kid home fuck, until the middle of October. Whew. Oh my God. I'm not going to go home today. My wife's going to freak out. <laughs> so, so Nick, Nick, how do you think that, that affects you, man, when you know that 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 uh, school, right? Online learning. I know the deal we're looking at. The, we we're looking at in South Texas is by a major university, right? Now these students don't even have to be there in town. They can be at home. Let's say they live in in the valley. Let's say they live in San Antonio or in Houston, and they were going to school there. Now they don't have to go, which means they don't have to sign a lease contract. And if it's optional, that means you pretty much canceled your fall leases. How's that going to affect everything? Yeah, I mean, I think that's we've been waiting to see. I know a lot of these uh, these deals that have universities as as drivers are, are you know, are concerned about that for sure. Uh, and actually, leasing has been pretty, pretty strong. We've got a couple in Nacogdoches right now. Leasing's been really, really strong there. Um, you know, uh, and, and so yeah, I don't know. Again, it's it's like say some of the time. I think everybody just needs to process and figure out. Hey, what what is Plan B here? And and you know, are you, if it's just a partial, uh, 
you know, if, if it's like you said, it's, it's some of these, you know, I know that's, that's public schools, right? But I mean, if some of these are partial, um, we're going to start the school year and let everybody, you know, let this kind of die down a little bit before we get in person, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see, like, do you, do you do a half semester lease? Do you still have to go ahead and sign the whole lease? Who, who's going to, who's going to bend on that? You know, which apartments are going to say, oh yeah, no, we'll work with you. Which you're saying, hey, no, you still got to mm -hmm. sign the whole, you know, the whole school year. So, and I, I don't know, it's, it's not great news, you know, I, I mean, there's nothing positive about that, that news, um, but yeah, I figured some school district at some point would 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 take that stance, um, and and it'll be interesting to see how the dominoes fall. I, I don't know, uh, I don't know what the response will be to that. Yeah. Hey, hey, Brandon, let's go to Napa Valley, take the family, let's just hang out there until mid October. Learn online. They can learn. Happy. Let's go, Nick. You want to come? Let's go. All right, all right. I missed my nap. I had a Napa trip this summer too that I missed. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys. I gotta pick up some more wine. I already ran out. You know, one of the the common questions I get from some of our students and just just investors in general in passing at, at you know some of the small meetups we've had and whatnot uh, are asking, you know, when is when is the right time to be standing at the start line ready to you know attack? Right? When when do you think is is the right time to get in here and, and be cash ready and start to you know start foaming at the mouth ready to buy a deal like when do you think that's going to happen are we going to see an influx in q1 is nmhc in, Jul in january going to be you know time to ball out i mean what what do you guys think as far as you know it, it, nobody has a crystal ball but if you were to say you know when a good time is to be ready to 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 buy and some you know kind of capitalize off some of these people who may be forced to exit their deal what, what, what do you think what are your thoughts on that <laughs> I think now, I think you get prepared now. I think it's one of those things where when you see it happening, you're kind of late to the game, mm -hmm. right? I mean, have your in a row now, be talking to your investors, like Robert said, um, you know, be talking to Nick daily on what you're looking for as a, as a buyer and real estate's real estate. You're not buying it for, you know, 2020, you're yeah. buying it for said, five years, seven years, whatever it is. Well, and, you know, Robert alluded to, you know, hey, I, I started my business after the recession, right, or during the recession even. And, and look, if I if I were to name the top 10, you know, multifamily owners over the last, you know, five, 10 years, uh, you know, most of those guys really got going after the last downturn or, or were really active if they were already going before. They got real, real active after that. I mean, I, I think, you know, we've all been sitting around saying, man, this market's so good, so good, so good. I can't wait for a little bit of a reset. Well, if this isn't a reset, I don't know what reset you're waiting for. I mean, you know, the, 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 the silver lining with this reset is that you, you happen to have uh, interest rates in the high twos, low threes, you know, yeah. and uh, and really the fundamentals aren't bad. You just have some, some uh, you know, a, a, an issue that nobody ever would have anticipated that, that we're dealing with so i mean i 100 agree I, I think if you're not looking and gearing up right now then then you're going to look back and and a few years and be like oh man i missed an opportunity there i really had a chance to to buy a, a very good deal i probably could have got a little bit of a discount i could have locked in a really really low interest rate and um now the market's kind of taken off again and you know i, I missed out a little bit so yeah i i, I think i think now is, is a good time to be really, really serious about it. You know, Nick, you bring up a really good point. My very first deal, I had it locked in at 3.2. It's back in 2009, October. And I forgot, it was right, right during the recession. And we asked for a price deduct. My business partner wanted a price deduct to 2.9. And they wouldn't do it. And that deal sat there until we picked it up again in February at the 2.9. And it's worth like $11 million today. But the question is, but the question, did that $300,000 really make a big a difference? You know, holding on to that $300,000 deduct, I could have lost that deal. That's probably the second greatest deal that I owned. And I almost lost it because of a couple hundred thousand dollars. So if you're yeah. thinking long term, right, what's a couple hundred thousand when you're talking 10, 15, 20 million dollar deals? It's nothing. Yeah. Right. So it's one of those things where you have to you have to have a little bit of cowboy in you, right? You got to think future. You got to think we're not buying it for today, as Brandon said. You're not buying it for 2020. 2020 is going to be a giant asterisk, you know, like in the history books. We're buying it for 20 from you know for from 2022 to 2030. 
you yeah. know? And so you, you yeah. just got to think about those things. So I, I think that's a really good point there. Yeah, you, you kind of got to see through the weed, right? Like there's just, yeah. there's, there's so much noise so yeah. much going on with all this stuff. You, you kind of got to look past that and say, well, the fundamentals of this deal are pretty good. You know, we know what's happened. We know how it's affected these deals, the economy overall, et cetera. But you, you, you got to be able to see through the weeds, see the potential, like you said, right? That's what the lenders are looking for. They're looking for the potential. They're looking for security and knowing that this person can pull off what they say they can. Uh, and if you can see through the weeds, I think there's some really good opportunities out there for a lot of people. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's it for the questions I have, guys. Is, is there anything that you guys want to add? I mean, I know you, you kind of hinted, Nick, on the, on the silver lining, and I think, you know, we're kind of talking about it right now, right? It's interest rates are really low. There are definitely some opportunities out there where you might be able to get a deal a little cheaper than you could. Um, and, and that may continue for the next six months, right? Where it's, you know, this is, this is a good buying opportunity for those who are serious about it. Um, and any other silver linings or any, anything else you guys want to mention? Yeah, I'll mention one other thing. I mean, yeah, look, first of all, yeah, less competition, slightly lower prices, interest rates, you know, being at historical lows. I mean, great. You know, that that's all really, really uh, positive. I think for, for one of the things that we realized during this time is we, you know, had time to kind of take a uh, step back and look at, at our business as a whole is, is how many other fairly large markets are around us, not just in Texas, but even in the surrounding states that really aren't being covered that much. We've had a few experiences where we happen to have a client that owned there that we've been able to sell a deal there. And so that is what we've really done is, is beefed up uh, our secondary markets team during this time. And so not just East Texas, Central Texas, West Texas, but you know, New Mexico, Oklahoma, um, you know, Arkansas, Louisiana, even on into some parts of Mississippi and, and all the way up to Omaha, Nebraska. And so all that to say is, is we're really, really excited about just other opportunities independent uh, of, of these major markets that, that we've all done really well in. And so those, those opportunities aren't going to cease by any means. But I, I think uh, we're, we're, you know, I think a silver lining for us has been just being able to kind of dig into some new areas, new opportunities um, for, for people looking for cash flow and just good solid real estate and, and good and good markets. So mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a really good thing for, for our team moving forward and for our, our clients and, and investors moving forward who may at various points in time feel like DFW is overheated, Houston's overheated, Austin's overheated, you know, just give people some other options uh, and opportunities to look in some of these other markets. Yeah. What about you, Brandon? Yeah, same thing. I kind of mentioned it earlier, just, you know, having actually the time to kind of take a breath, take a look at, you know, your internal procedures, processes, or models. Um, you know, I know that uh, our team has really beefed up our uh, sales comps, you know, talking with appraisers, trading information, just all that data that really helps us a lot of times, you know, make the deal work. Uh, get a few more dollars, whatever it may be. Uh, and then also just kind of take a step back and, and look at the market. Um, you know, I tell the young guys in the office that, you know, I started in uh, early 2001 in the business and then 9-11 hit. And it was kind of a bummer in a way, but at the same time, uh, the principal at the firm, he said, you know what, it's a great time to call people because they're going to take your call. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing now, you know, a lot more People are willing to just hear what you have to say. Nick hit on that earlier. Just, you know, he's not selling a lot of deals, but just being a resource, you know, uh, someone in the market that just kind of hears what's going on. They want to hear from me on, hey, what are you hearing from other guys that own property? Uh, so it's been a you know, silver lining has been able to just, you know, make, make those connections again and uh, take a step back, take a look at the market as a whole. Um, and I, I'm, I'm still very bullish. I think fundamentals are great, like Nick said, yeah. despite uh, what's going on. Yeah, I, I, I think for, for passive investors, too, you know, the, the fact that, you know, uh, the, the way the banks are underwriting these deals and making them put, you know, 12 months expenses or whatever, you know, in escrow, I think it gives, you know, a little bit more sense of stability for some of the passive investors, knowing that, you know, the operator that they're buying, that they're investing with, right? They're a little bit protected, right? They kind of have training wheels on because of lenders and how they're underwriting right now. So it kind of gives them a little more confidence in knowing that, you know, this person took out enough money and set enough money aside in case something happens. What do you think, Robert? Yeah, you know, I, 
Yeah, I wanted to add, you know, when I did my first deal in 2010, I paid six and a quarter percent interest rate, six and a half, six and a quarter. And the fundamentals of deals today are so much better than back then. You're talking half at three and a quarter, at three and a half. So if you're ready to take advantage of that. Now's a good time to invest in the right spots, the right location with the right syndicator. Now's a great time to invest. But if you're not ready, now's an also another great time to educate yourself, to find some education and so you can be ready. I, I love to ask Nick and uh, Brandon when they think the, those big deals are gonna come, when those forbearance you know, things start to kick in, you're looking at another six to nine months, you know, you know, maybe upwards of a year before those guys that took the forbearance, right, are, are gonna have to make a decision do I pay back the forbearance or do I sell the deal, right? It's going to be all those guys that bought in the last 24 months that weren't able to make their debt service. But if you want to be ready, now's a great time to educate yourself, to find a mentor. Hey, at Rockstar Academy, we launched a new site that gives you a chance to take videos, watch it by me, watch how I, how I analyze deals, how I look at the deals, or even get personal mentoring. Carl, you said we have one guy left, right? One spot left yeah. a, for, for our one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, um, the, the, the uh, inaugural class. I'll introduce you to Brandon Brown. You'll get to sit down with Nick. Nick. You'll get to sit in with all the other brokers, and we'll talk and try to find you a deal and get you going so you can look at those deals when they come due in the beginning of 2021. Nick, what do you think about that, man? Do you think you're going to see a lot of deal flow in, the, in Q1, Q2? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I, I think if you didn't have enough money to keep your deal out of forbearance, then I don't know why all of a sudden you're going to have enough money, you know, six, nine months later to, to you know, bail yourself out. I mean, I think it's... Uh, I think generally speaking, that's that's a sinking ship and, and somebody is is probably, you know, at some point will give up and just punt and move on down to the next deal and, and you know, let somebody else recapitalize the deal and take it over. So I'm sure some will save it, but I do. I think that, that will be, uh, you'll see a wave of, of those deals coming at some point. Hey, Brandon, if people were to contact yeah. you at LMI Capital, would you be able to provide for them a list of those guys that, that took the uh, forbearance loans? Do you have access to that? Is that public record? That's a good question. I mean, if it's a, if it's, a, if it's in a, if it's an agency loan or a CMB, yeah. loan, I'm, I'm not sure if Trep's following that or not. Um, there are sources that, databases that follow those payments and P and Ls, and it's all public record because it's a securitized deal. Uh, if they took a forbearance, I'm assuming those people would have that note as well. Mm. They, well, they, Brandon, they, I'm going to follow up with you on that because I want to know if that list exists. Yeah, look, I think that, you know, the main question here really is, right, is when are these deals coming? And I think early next year, there's going to be a lot of this. There's going to be the forbearance has gone away. There's going to be the P&I kicked in after the interest only went away. The property's not capitalized. They're, you know, they're starting to bleed a little bit and there's going to be opportunity. I'm looking at one now I can't quite talk about. It's in Central Texas and it's a scenario where someone has struck a deal to, you know, basically buy the property at a little bit of, above the note um, because the, the guys that are on the note have, you know, been working with that lender to, you know, give them the time to make this sell. And so this person is going to be buying it at about a million dollars or so less than it traded in 20, what, uh, 18, I guess. So wow. starting to kind of see some of that start to play out. Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, Brandon, where can where can people find you if they want to get more information? Uh, so share your website if you would, and then your and then your, your email. That's yeah, the website's easy. Yeah, this website's easy. LMICapital.com. Uh, on there, there's a button you can click. It's just you know info at LMI. It comes to me and my business partner, um, and that's that's the easiest way to, to to get in touch with us. Nick, how about you, bud? Yeah, so our, our team website is multifamilyadvisors.com, uh, multifamilyadvisors.com, and then my uh, email is is my name, nick.fluellen at marcusmillichap.com. And uh, obviously, you can always visit the apartmentrockstar.com, sign up for our email list, our passive investor list, or check out some yeah. of the education stuff. So. Hey, you yeah, if you want to send me an email directly, Nick, I hope you're writing this down. It's uh, Robert at rockstar-capital.com. Let me know if you want to invest with the other Rockstar investors. Or Nick, if you heard that email, you can send me some of your best deals so I can use Brandon. <laughs> he sourced every one of our loans, so I, I want to keep that free yeah. going. Uh, but also, if you need some uh, some apartment education videos, find us at apartment rockstar. I'm sorry. Yeah, find us at uh, apartmentrockstaracademy.com. Yep. Cool. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate everybody's time and I uh, hope everybody got some value out of this. If you got any questions, reach out to anyone that's uh, that's here on the webinar. 
Hey, Nick, DB, thank you very much. It's great to see you guys. Thank hey, you. Enjoyed guys. it. Everybody be good. Thanks, everybody. Are we off?